Okay, so, well, let's get, uh, first, before we talk about the man, let's talk about the times. Okay, so it's a good uh, context of who, who is, uh, what's the times that this man lived in. And so first, we see uh, Hillary's born uh, probably around 315, so right around the time period that Christianity is being made legal. And uh, the, we see Constantine the first with uh, the Edict of Milan, and then uh, we also see Pope Sylvester, who is uh, elected just right after the legalization of Christianity. Uh, and by the way, Sylvester is the 33rd successor of Peter, so Constantine did not found the Catholic Church. Uh, okay, just to let you know, some people think so. Okay, now, uh, also around this time period, uh, we have historical records of him about 319, but he was probably causing troubles before then, and that is uh, an Alexandrian priest named Arius, who's starting to teach that the son is of a similar substance, or homoiousis, to the father. He's not God, he's a creature. And one of the ways that he was popularizing this is he wrote songs to popularize his heresy. So there was a time when Arius, uh, there was a time when the sun was not, this, these are the words of Arius, right? Uh, he's a creature, uh, there was a time when he didn't exist, he's not from the Father, etc. And uh, unfortunately, these hymns that he was having the people sing really did make inroads into the belief of a lot of the people. Now, uh, we see that in this division, Constantine had originally uh, legalized Christianity with the idea. Now, Constantine himself did not get baptized till his deathbed, and he, in fact, kept a lot of his pagan titles. But he saw the uh, he saw Christianity as the glue that he could put the empire back together in. So he was quite shocked that after he made it legal to find out that this uh, Christian uh, movement, which was so powerful that the you know. 300 years of persecution couldn't put it down, that uh, he was really surprised to find that it wasn't totally unified. And so in good senatorial thought, what do you do when you have a controversy is you get all of the patricians together, you make a compromise, and you all live with it, right? Yes. So Constantine, even though he's not the pope, calls a council at Nicaea, which is only about a mile away from Constantinople and uh, gets all the bishops together in the east, and Sylvester, who's still in Rome, sends a legate to represent, of course, the church, as well as these eastern bishops, and fortunately, because of the forceful preaching of the deacon Athanasius, at this time Alexander is the bishop in Alexandria, uh, the deacon Athanasius comes and very powerfully uh, convinces the fathers at Nicaea that the son is homo usios, or same substance as the father. Okay, and so we have the Nicene Creed that we say Sunday Mass, right? God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the father. So that's all from the Marian uh, controversy, okay? Now, you'd think it would all be put to bed, right? <laughs> Alexander dies, Athanasius gets elected, uh, uh, Arius uh, is really good at uh, accusing him. In fact, he accuses Athanasius of murder, uh, a sacrilegious murder at that, that he killed a priest during the Mass and spilled the precious blood. Well, Athanasius had to produce that deacon, not priest, uh, at three different trials. It says, hold up, one, one story is he had his hand cut off, Another story is he was murdered, so the deacon kept having to show up at these trials and say, here's my, here's my hand, I still have it, and I'm still alive, okay. <laughs> well, so, now, I, this is a talk on Hillary, not Athanasius, so I uh, need to get moving. Okay, uh, now, in 329, Constantine, uh, because of influences of his wife, who has adopted Arianism, his second wife, uh, he recalls Arius and the Arian bishops. Okay, so the problem doesn't go away. 
Okay? Now, uh, what will happen is uh, Arius evidently did uh, a couple of stupid things. So he got, he got banished again, uh, and, and then he'll, he'll die uh, about a year after the, this banishment. Okay? Now, uh, Constantine himself will be baptized by the Arian bishop Eusebius of Vercelli, I think that is correct. No, Nicodemus, excuse me, Vercelli is the, is the Catholic one. My apologies, I get the Eusebius mixed up. Okay, so uh, he gets baptized an Ar by an Arian bishop, okay. Now, Constantine's three sons are now going to become uh, emperor. So first we have Constantine, Constantine the first, or excuse me, second, uh, Constantius II, because he's named after his grandfather, Const Constantius Chlorus. Uh, and then, uh, eventually, the youngest son of Constantine, Constans, will join his uh, brothers. <coughs> okay? Now, Constantine II is killed in battle, uh, and Constans, who, uh, well, he starts out in Egypt, but eventually he'll get Gaul, England, Spain, and then even into Italy, and he is going to back the Pope. Okay, so he's pro-Catholic, he's backing the Pope. Uh, Constantius, on the other hand, whose mother was an Arian, uh, he is going to promote Arianism in the East. So, now obviously, uh, by the way, Diocletian is the one that split the Roman Empire into East and West, okay? So, uh, this is basically, this pattern is being held. So Constantius is in the East, Constance is in the West. And, uh, well, you can read the PowerPoint. Okay, now, Constance is assassinated in 350. Uh, and so Constantius now is the sole ruler of the empire, and he's Arian, and so he is going to, uh, he's determined that Arianism is going to be the state religion. Okay, now, there are, among the Arianists, there are several different camps, okay? There's the Homo, Homoousian, uh, homoi is the Greek word for similar, substance, and usios is the word for substance, okay? Uh, homo usios then, same substance, homoi usios would be similar substance, but there's now a more radical Aryan gr a group that would say there's absolutely no similarity between the nature of the Father and the Son, okay? Jesus is a creature and completely different than God, okay? now. Uh, Constant, Constantius did not support that version of Arianism. His version of Arianism was the Homoousians. Okay, so he's saying similar substance. Okay, now, as you can see, he exiles Pope Liberius uh, and brings him to the east, and he will actually mistreat and browbeat Liberius and, until at a certain point he'll just give up and sign uh, a moderate Arian creed. Uh, but as soon as he's released, he'll say, I did that under duress, and deny it again. So as soon as he's free, he immediately denies the Arian Creed that he was forced to sign. Uh, by the way, Liberius is the first pope not to be canonized. Okay, so, uh, although I think he suffered for the faith, too. But it, probably because of that moment of weakness, he, he got uh, taken out of the list. Now, also... Uh, we see Athanasius is kicked out of Alexandria, and they, uh, so Felix is an anti-pope that is put in the place of Liberius, and uh, Athanasius is also replaced by an Arian bishop named George. Okay, so George of Alexandria. Okay, now, at this time, this is about the time that Hillary is going to become bishop, the elected bishop in Poitiers. Okay, so... Uh, this is, if you would, the historical context of when Hillary becomes active as a bishop in the church. But let's backtrack a little bit and talk about who is he. But first of all, let's talk about where's Poitiers, okay? So, uh, Poitiers is, if you can see up there, uh, I tried to make it. I need to figure out how to use a... Will I actually get a laser? Shoot my eye out. I don't know. Okay, here. Uh, no, I don't see anything, so I'm just going to move on. Okay, so, oops, I just did something and it went away. Okay, now, 
uh, where does he get uh, exiled to his Phrygia? So that'd be modern day Turkey, okay, if you're trying to picture where they are. Now, Hillary uh, is, so as you can see, Poitiers is just uh, a little bit south of Tours. You know, Martin of Tours, who is a father of the church, but I don't think he's a doctor. I don't see him there. Okay. So, the man himself now. Uh, how many, I've talked for 10 minutes about the context. Let's talk about the man. Okay, so uh, Hillary is born a pagan, roughly around the same time period. Uh, most of these things are approximates, right? Because the dating systems and things like that, and records. It, it seems as if he was born right around the time of Christianity being made legal. However, he is a patrician or noble pagan. His parents are, are pagans, and uh, he gets an excellent education in literature, rhetoric, philosophy, and things like that. Now, he, he's one of those saints that read himself into the church, okay? Uh, after taking the courses in philosophy and rhetoric, he then uh, proceeded to read the Old Testament. And in fact, in uh, his book, De Trinitate, the very first book, is really the story of his own conversion, where he talks about, uh, you know, at a certain point in my life, I realized that there's more to life than just filling my belly and, uh, and living, and then I die and I go in a hole. There must be something more to life than that. The gods must, that no god is very kind uh, if they would make a human being with with a mind, and then he would just have the same pleasures as an animal. I can't believe that, okay? So he comes, he's kind of restless, asking questions, so he reads the Old Testament, and he comes upon Exodus 3.14. I am who am, right, to Moses? Tell them I am who am sent me. And it's, it's kind of like, the lights go on for Hillary, is like, oh, this is the God of the philosophers, but now he's in He's in the, the Hebrew Scriptures. I'm going to read more. Okay, so he reads the Old Testament, and then he reads the New Testament, and by the time he gets to the New Testament, he asks for baptism. Now, he did get married relatively young, and they had one daughter uh, named Abra, okay? Uh, and soon after his uh, baptism, he and his wife uh, decided to live uh, celibately. So to live a life of penance and celibacy. So Abra is their only daughter. Now, uh, only about eight years after he is baptized, he is unanimously elected uh, the Bishop of Poitiers. So the very place, his birthplace, is actually where he's elected to become Bishop. Okay, so uh, as you can see, 353, that's right when Constant Constantius is starting to impose Arianism on everybody. Now, from the beginning, uh, Hillary is on the Catholic side, all right? Uh, and he is going to, now at first he does not use the word homoousios, but as when he gets exiled to the East, and he gets introduced to the Eastern theologians, he starts to use that in his writings. But at the first, uh, he's not necessarily using the Nicene language, but he will eventually. Okay, so now he is, uh, there is a synod in Paris in 355 where the bishops of Gaul uh, get together, and he's one of the leading speakers there defending the Nicene Creed. Okay, uh, and he calls for the deposition of the Arian bishops, Ursius, I think I spelled that, okay, my Latin scholar, you can tell me. I'm going to do a church Latin now, okay? So, uh, Ursusius and Valens and then Saturninus of Arles, okay? Now, what happens is Arianism is condemned at that, at that uh, Paris Synod, but right after that Synod, the next year, Saturninus will call the Council of Bar Bézier, yes, Bézier, uh, and Hillary, of course, will refuse to go to it. He calls it the uh, Synod of the False Apostles. But Constantius makes him go. And when he does, uh, he, all the bishops are threatened with exile if they don't sign the Arian Creed of that uh, Synod. And there are three bishops that are exiled, and Hillary is one of them. 
Okay, so he is at first allowed to go back to his own diocese, but with the understanding that as soon as they decide where he's going to be exiled, he has to leave. Okay, so uh, in 356, he is sentenced to exile, uh, and it won't be until the summer of 356 that he'll be sent to Phrygia. Well, meantime, who shows up at his door before his exile is St. Martin of Tours. If you remember, he's famous for cutting his cloak in half and giving it to a beggar. Now, Martin is already baptized. What just happened? It seems as if the projector went off. Okay, where, where's Dusty? Okay. All right, I'm getting taped. There he is. The, the projector is shut off. So what happened? Everything else is on. So it's on. It sounds like the it sounds like your projector is. Uh, well, it sounds like the fan's on. Okay. Well, I can keep talking if you don't mind uh, pictures. Okay. You go ahead. Don't mind me. All right. Well, I'm now trapped by the desk. Okay, so we'll do it this way. Okay, so I guess I get exiled to non electronics. Okay, here we go. All right, so Hillary is, uh, he, or, by the way, he ordains St. Martin a deacon. He's like, all of a sudden, it's all right, God's answered my prayer. Now I've got somebody I can keep in charge while I am sent off to exile. So he tries to get Martin to become a priest, but uh, Martin says, I'm not worthy, I'm not going to do that. So uh, what uh, he does is he agrees to become a deacon, and Hillary uh, gives him, enrolls him as an exorcist. Okay. And so Hillary, or excuse me, Martin will, uh, again, be an ally in the fight against Arianism. In fact, very soon after that, St. Martin won't stay in, in Poitiers. He will, he will go all the way back to Pannonia, where he was originally from. Uh, which would be kind of over towards Albania, uh, to try to convert his parents to Christianity. And on his way there and on his way back to France, he will fight Arians all the way. Okay. But again, it's not the story of St. Martin. We have to get back to play, uh, Hillary. So uh, in the summer of 356, Hillary is sent to Phrygia. Oh, looks like we might get something here. Uh, and there, uh, he will start, uh, no matter where he goes, hooray, it's back. <laughs> okay. Well, no matter where he goes, he is fighting Arians. Okay. Now, why would Constantius put him into Phrygia is because uh, Phrygia is an uh, Arian stronghold. All right. So uh, they figure that the Arians will rub up on him and not the other way around. What happens instead, of course, is Hillary, uh, for one thing, he seems to have been pretty free to be able to write letters home. So he wrote and guided his uh, diocese uh, from exile. And he also helped to influence the other bishops of Gaul uh, to do the right thing as well. Okay, so, and we'll see that when we look at his writings. Okay, so it's here that he starts to learn Greek and read the Greek fathers and talk to some of the Greek fathers who are actually alive at the same time hit as he is. In fact, Athanasius, what's ironic is Athanasius gets exiled to Gaul and uh, Hillary is exiled to, to Phrygia or Turkey. Okay, so it's kind of ironic. And, and Athanasius will actually end up in Rome and write the, the uh, life of St. Anthony and it'll be very read read and very popular and spread throughout the area. So a lot of these people that are fighting for Catholic Orthodoxy know each other or at least have heard of each other and read each other's works. Okay, so this uh, reading the Greek Fathers means that Hillary uh, is getting more and more weapons for defending the faith more completely. In other words, Constantius is actually shooting himself in the foot. He, he, he. All right, now, uh, while he's in uh, exile, he starts to read, to write 
uh, his work, it might actually be a combination of two works, but the end result is what we call De Trinitate, De Trinitate, or On the Trinity. So it's a, and well, I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, now what happens is Hillary, he is a fighter, but he's not somebody that turns people off. He's always looking for a way to communicate with people, he's listening to them, he's sympathetic, and so he starts talking to the semi Aryans or the moderate Aryans, the homoousians, and saying things like, you know, really what you mean by homoousios is what I mean by homoousios. And so he just gently tries to take them from where they are and move them to where they should be. And because he does that, he's getting converts, right? And so the Aryan bishops are going to Constantius says, get him out of here, please. He's otherwise he's going to convert all our people. So he gets to go back after only uh, three years. He gets to go back home. So of course, all the people are, you can see them in the corner saying, yay, Hillary's back. Okay. So what happens is, uh, on his way there, by the way, is he's going to stop all sorts of different ways and keep teaching the truth wherever he goes, right? So he gradually gets home, and of course one of the first things he does is to set about undoing the damage that has been done while he's been gone. Uh, and again, he uses gentleness and reason uh, to get people back. And he says to a lot of the bishops of Gaul who had gone over to Arianism, basically because of fear and ignorance, they didn't want to go into exile, uh, he's made it very easy for them to come back and say, I know, I know you did that out of fear and things like that. Uh, and so he was able, when it, we had the Synod of Paris, again, and uh, so the regional meeting of the bishops, uh, we see that this synod now is going to adopt the Nicene uh, Creed language of homoousios and uh, that the Son is equal to the Father, consubstantial with the Father. And also, he gets rid of Saturninus. Okay, so goodbye, Saturninus. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Orthodoxy. Okay, so, uh, now, uh, in 362 to 364, he goes back to Italy, he goes to Milan, and he's going to help to try to get rid of the Bishop Axentius of Milan. Uh, now, he doesn't succeed. Uh, what happens, well, he does succeed to some extent, as in there are some victories for orthodoxy, but he doesn't get rid of Aixensius. Uh That will happen later. Uh, but uh, his work in Milan will actually open up the way for St. Ambrose to be elected the bishop in Milan. Okay, so Axensius will eventually get kicked out there will be a big, huge riot between the, the Catholics and the Iron, the Arians, Arians, okay, sorry. Brain burp there, I guess. But anyway, uh, so Ambrose is going to be a young Roman official that's going to come up to quell all the upset between the Catholics and the Arians fighting at Milan. And uh, when they all hear him, it's kind of like Ambrose for bishop, and it's kind of, wait a second, I know you're baptized, hold on, but... Again, that's another story. But uh, what we see is Hillary is pra pra praying the way everywhere he goes uh, to bring back Catholic Orthodoxy. And now Constantius dies in 361. And the reason that Arianism does not last in the West for very long after that is because Hillary is just tirelessly fighting against that heresy and converting people back to Catholic Orthodoxy the whole time. So through his zeal, kindliness, uh, but hard work too, uh, he's going to bring people uh, back to the faith. And then finally, Hillary himself will die at Poitiers at, in 367. And uh, there is a church still in Poitiers called uh, saint Hilaire de la Grande, so St. Hilary the Great. Uh, however, during the French Revolution, his uh, relics were burned However, there is a reliquary, and there's a picture of it there in the corner uh, in the crypt of, of the church. Okay, so now let's, we've talked about the man. Let's talk about the works that he did. Okay, so his works include, uh, his first work is a commentary on St. Matthew. 
And this was written uh, probably right after he became bishop. Okay, and uh, it is the it's 33 books, so uh, 30 books in this case uh, we're talking equivalent to chapters. Okay, so 33 uh, books on the Gospel of Matthew, uh, and it is the earliest extant uh, Latin commentary on Matthew. Okay, uh, the second, of course, is his most famous work. And that would be uh, De Trinitate, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail in a minute. And that consists of 12 books, okay, or 12 chapters. Uh, they're very thick chapters. Uh, now, the next one is De, De Synodus, which he also wrote during exile, probably the end of his exile. And this basically is he's writing this to help the Gallic bishops to stay orthodox. So what he's doing is he's looking at the different creeds uh, and comparing them and commenting on them and the different decrees of different synods in the East and showing these are, these are the orthodox ones, these are the erroneous ones, and this is why. Okay. Uh, so that was to help the, the, the bishops back in France. Okay, and again, he also uses the conciliatory language of trying to show the semi-Aryans why their stance is actually, if, if, if you look at it, you're saying the same thing we are. Why don't you just use our language? Okay. Uh, the next, this one I find a little bit humorous, is the Liber Ad Constantium Augustum and then the Contra Constantium uh, Imperatum. Uh, and that would be, the first one is a letter to Constantius asking for uh, an interview. I want to talk to you, okay? Uh, but it's obvious that Constantius is not going to listen to him and he's favoring the Arian bishops and so he writes the second one is like the nasty letter of you are a persecutor of the church. So here's a little quote from, uh, here let me try to get to my notes. Okay, here is a quote from Contra Constantium. Are you ready? What then is the character of the persecution of Constantius? We fight against a persecutor who tries to receive us, against a foe who ever offers us blandishments, against Constantius the Antichrist. He does not prescribe us that we should be deprived of our lives, but he endows us that we may gain spiritual death. He does not crush out our life by imprisonment and so give us liberty, but he gives us posts of honor in the palace which bring us into bondage. I say to thee, Constantius, what I would have said to Nero, what Decius and Maximian, Maximinius would have heard from me. It is against God you fight, against his church you rage. You persecute his saints, you hate those who preach Christ, you take away true religion. It's like, well, don't get this guy angry. Okay, but uh, if we look at that, what is he saying? He's saying, Constantius, you're binding the church by uh, making bishops into career people instead of successors of the apostles. Woe to you, because what's worse, to have our lives taken away or for you to spiritually corrupt us? And so he's right on on that. And uh, you can imagine there are a couple of bishops that might have hung their head in shame and been converted by that type of language. Okay, now, uh, if I can, all the electronics that, okay, come on. There it is. All right. Excuse me a moment. Technology is so lovely. All right, there we go. Okay, the next one is Contras Auxentium. Okay, he's the one that he was trying to kick out of Milan. So after he got kicked out of Milan, instead of Exentius, he wrote a, a letter uh, for true orthodoxy, right? And, and so he's, again, an opportunity to say the truth about, um, about the... Okay, just a second. I think that, is that right? Okay, good. Now, one of his last works uh, that he wrote uh, probably after his return from exile was the Instructio Psalmorum, or the Instructions on the Psalms. Now, it's probably likely 
that he did write a commentary on all 150 psalms. However, uh, only 58 of them are extant. Okay. Uh, by the way, he also wrote a commentary on Job, which uh, we know of because of quotes from other writers. Uh, but I don't know if it's available in modern times. Uh, but he also wrote song, songs. Okay? He learned how effective it was for Arius to spread his heresy through songs. And so he wrote orthodox songs, or songs that he had sung in, in, the, in his church. Okay? So Ambrose introduced music as in the antiphonal uh, singing of the psalms that we're used to now with uh, Liturgy of the Hours and things. But uh, in the case of Hillary, he actually did also introduce hymns uh, with orthodox lyrics because he saw how powerful that was. And we actually have three of his hymns extant too. Okay. Uh, however, I don't have a copy of those right with me, sorry. But I don't want to take it too long. Oh well, you might sleep well tonight, right? Okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, let's see, a little quote from the Psalms. Now, it is evident that Hillary had read Origin while he was in the East. Okay, so, uh, as I think I have there in my notes, it's obvious that he's indebted to Origen for a lot of his ideas, especially this idea of interpreting the Old Testament allegorically. Okay? Now, this uh, quote from the instructions of the Psalms will show you kind of the key to his interpretation. So, there is no doubt that all the things that are said in the Psalm should be understood in accordance with the Gospel. Proclamation. To that so that whatever the voice with which the prophetic spirit has spoken, all may be referred nevertheless to the knowledge of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the incarnation, passion, and kingdom, and to the power and glory of the resurrection. Okay, so he definitely saw King David and all the other Psalms as prophetic and pointing to Jesus, uh, the Word of God, second person of the Trinity. Okay. You love to hate it, right? Okay. Let me get over here. Yay! So, the summary of De Trinitate. So, let's look at his most famous work in a little bit more detail, uh, although it's not near the detail of the book itself, okay? The book is this thick, okay? With small print. All right. Uh, remember that Hillary was a rhetorician, and so he's very eloquent, beautiful, elegant Latin. But he also says it in about five times more words than he said. <laughs> okay. All right. But it's very good. It's orthodox. And in fact, he's the real pioneer, or he cut the trail for teachings on the Trinity. And in fact, later, later writers will be very much in debt, like uh, especially Augustine, will be very much in debt to uh, Hillary's work. Okay, so the first book is the story of his own conversion, and I kind of already referred to that earlier in the talk. Uh, the this, this second and third chapters are looking at the concept of the three persons and one God, uh, and he uses as his launching point uh, Jesus' command from Matthew 28, go, preach the gospel, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so. Uh, in other words, if, if Jesus, our Savior, is saying, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, then these three must be equal. So, launching off from baptismal faith and creed, uh, I'm going to show that Jesus is true God. Okay. And then the rest of the book, so this would be books 4 through 12, uh, Hillary will develop the doctrine of homoousios, or same substance, consubstantial. Uh, that the Son is the same substance or consubstantial with the Father. So, uh, just a few sampling quotes. Like I said, I'm not going to read you the whole book. Okay, so thank God, right? Otherwise, we'd be here until tomorrow morning. But, uh, so here's uh, some quotes. This would be from uh, chapter 2, so the opening lines of chapter 2. Jesus has commanded us to baptize in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. That is, in the confession of the author of the only begotten one and the gift. The author of all things is one alone, 
for one alone is God the Father, from whom all things proceed. And one alone is our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things exist. And one alone is the Spirit, a gift in all. And nothing can be found to be lacking so great a fullness, in which the immensity of the Eternal One, the revelation in the image, joy and the gift, converge in the Father, the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. Okay, so the opening lines of uh, chapter 2. And then uh, this is a quote from Saint, uh, Pope Benedict. Uh, by the way, if you're not familiar with this, Pope Benedict back about 19, or 2003, 2004, did a whole series of short talks on each of the church fathers, including Hillary. Uh, and uh, it's, I think, our late... Uh, our Sunday Visitor has actually uh, published it, the whole collection. So if you'd be interested in that, uh, Our Sunday Visitor has put it out, and I think there's another publisher that has also published those. Or you can find them on the Vatican website itself. Okay, but this is a quote from his talk on Hillary, uh, quoting De Trinitate also. So, God knows not how to be anything other than love. He knows not how to be anyone other than the Father. Those who love are not envious, and the one who is the Father is so in his totality. This name admits no compromise, as if God were Father in some aspects, and not in others. For this reason, the Son is fully God, without any gaps or diminishment. The one who comes from the perfect is perfect, because he has all and has given all. Okay, so, just some samplings of, of Hillary's writings. Uh, now, the actual text, if you go and read it, what you'll find is he'll go on and on about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then he'll break into a prayer. And then he'll go back and talk some more about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then he'll break out into another prayer. So, uh, and it's like, it's almost like he's having a dialogue with the Trinity as he's writing the book. So, it, it can be good spiritual reading, although understand, be ready for hearing the same thing over and over again. <laughs> okay. Uh, but we'll, we'll end with a, a prayer uh, of St. Hilary. This is the closing prayer, so the last paragraph uh, of the De Trinitate. Keep this piety of my faith undefiled, I beseech you, and lest, let this be the utterance of my convictions, even to the last breath of my spirit, that I may keep ever faithful to what I have professed in the creed of my regeneration, when I was baptized in the Father, in the Son, and in the Holy Spirit, that I may worship you, our Father, and with you, your Son, and that I may gain the favor of your Holy Spirit, who is from you through the only begotten. Amen. <laughs>